Hi, my name is Christy Bryant, and this is my movie analysis for MURB 461, Spring 2013. The movie that I chose was called The Doctor. It's based on a book by Edward Rosenbaum called My Own Medicine, When the Doctor's the Patient. It was written about 1988, I think. This movie was actually made in 1991. The plot of the movie starts out with William Hurt as Dr. Jack McKee. The cast of the movie includes William Hurt as Dr. Jack McKee, Christine Lottie as Anne McKee, Elizabeth Perkins as June Ellis, Adam Arkin as Dr. Eli Bloomfield and Wendy Creason as Dr. Leslie Abbott. The plot of the movie starts out, basically what happens in the movie in the beginning is it starts out in the OR. Dr. McKee is in the OR repairing um, an aortic dissection. He is a well-known cardiothoracic surgeon in a teaching facility. A young man attempted suicide from jumping off of a building and he is actually in the OR trying to repair his aorta. He has three minutes to repair this before the young man passes away. And in that moment, in that OR, um, the environment's very casual. They are playing loud music, um, crude comments between physicians. Dr. McKee does not really pay attention to the patient himself, but he is actually just performing a procedure, kind of detached. It's just kind of a, a light-hearted atmosphere, even though there's a very serious issue going on. Um, he ends up repairing the aorta and saves the young man's life, and in the middle of this procedure, another person from a different OR comes to ask Dr. McKee for a second opinion in the OR next door by a doctor named uh, Dr. Bloomfield is requesting his assistance. So Dr. McKee goes into the next OR, which is a completely different environment from the OR that he runs. Dr. Bloomfield's OR is very calm, quiet, soothing. Even though the patient's under general anesthesia, Dr. Bloomfield speaks to the patient and tells him exactly everything that he's doing to the patient and what he plans on doing. Um, Dr. McKee makes fun of Dr. Bloomfield for speaking to the patient, even though he's under general, and talking to him and actually gives his a second opinion, but he also is, is, says kind of a crude comment towards the patient as well. And Dr. McKee leaves the OR. After this, Dr. McKee um, is around in with his interns and residents, and in the hallway, they speak of the patients that they are going to go see for the day, for the morning, but they don't speak of them by name. They speak of them by procedure, the procedure that they did. Um, when it came to going to see the attempted suicide patient, Dr. McKee refers to him as the aortic dissection, the aortic repair. Um, once they go in the room, they don't really involve the patient at all um, with the examination. They speak amongst each other what they're going to do, um, basically go over the procedure. Dr. McKee listens to the patient, looks at him for a moment, kind of speaks to him for a minute, and leaves the room. He doesn't really emotionally attach to him at all. In the hallway, Dr. McKee tells the residents and interns that the job of a surgeon is to get in, fix it, and get out, that caring takes too much time. He's very emotionally detached from his patients. Um, even in the examination room post-op, when they come back to his office, he's very emotionally detached, um, cold, kind of cold. Um, it shows him at home as well with his family. Um, he has a little son that he does not get to spend much time with due to the long hours that he works. His wife, he's emotionally detached from her as well. He forgets things that he's promised her um, that he would do with them as a family, help her with school and involve in, with their son. Um, there is one time that they actually do get to be together to go out for dinner. And they go, and then on the way home, Dr. McKee is 
bothered with an irritating cough that he's had for months. And he's a former smoker. So he coughs so severely in the car that he actually coughs up blood. And his wife is concerned, so he promises her that he will go to see a physician about it. He goes to see Dr. Leslie Abbott, who is a well-known um, pulmonary physician in their hospital. So as he is sitting in the waiting room, he kind of gets a taste of what it's like to be a patient, to have to sit and wait on a physician, um, filling out the paperwork, going in to see the physician as he's sitting there. Dr. Abbott comes in. She doesn't really introduce herself very well. She's very cold. She just matter-of-factly asks you know, what the problem is. She doesn't really explain the procedure that she's going to do to him. She's kind of rough with her bedside manner and rough with dealing with him when she's looking at him, feeling in his mouth, um, looking down his throat with a scope. Um, she doesn't really explain what she sees. She doesn't explain anything until the end when she just turns around and looks at him and says, you have a growth on your vocal cord and I need a biopsy it tomorrow and just turns around. She schedules the biopsy for the next day, um, doesn't take into consideration how he feels about the time when, you know, she doesn't look at him as a doctor. She looks at him as a normal patient. Um, so he has the biopsy and it's malignant. He is told by her that he is going to have to have um, daily radiation and there's 80% cure rate for this kind of cancer. Um, he says he wants it taken out and she says that they're going to do the radiation. So he starts the radiation, daily radiation therapy. He goes into the radiation um, suite and they are cold with him there as well. Um, do things to him there that they really don't explain very much. Um, he's scared. You can see the look on his face that he's scared, but they really don't recognize that. Um, he continues to try to work as this is going on, and he's sitting in the waiting room day after day after day, waiting for his radiation, and he is upset because he has to continuously fill forms out at different places, different units, if they don't share the information. He's very upset at the fact that they don't take into consideration that he is a physician at that facility. They treat him like any other patient and make him wait in the waiting room for the physician um, to be ready for him for the radiation. Um, in the meantime, as time goes on, he meets a patient waiting in the waiting room named June, June Ellis, and she's a very young girl. She looks like she's in her 20s. Um, she has an inoperable stage 4 brain tumor that she told him took them three months to diagnose because they blew it off. They did a few other tests. They never really listened to her. They never thought about what it, that it possibly could be a brain tumor. And ultimately, um, they become friends. Um, she, he lies to her about a, a patient that he says his father had that was cured with a stage 4 brain tumor. And she found out that he lied and he admitted it and told her that all she needed was an MRI and that they should have done an MRI on her and it would have cost about a thousand dollars to do this test. They would have found her tumor and could have treated it. And she's dumbfounded at that fact and she said, you know, she you can tell by the look on her face that she's like that that one test cost a thousand dollars would have saved her life but now she's going to die. And she begs him to please never to lie ever to a patient again. Um, they become friends. They end up going on a trip together. As time goes on, he finds out the radiation does not take care of his cancer and he has to have it removed. Um, he's very worried about this because um, he possibly could lose his voice. So the person that he chooses to do the procedure is Dr. Bloomfield, the one that he made fun of in the OR. He did not want Dr. Abbott to do the procedure because of her poor bedside manner. He's realized as a patient, he sees the other side of the coin. He sees how patients are treated. 
that everyone's detached from their patient, that they don't really involve them, and he understands now that that's a very important thing. And he asked Dr. Bloomfield to do the procedure. Dr. Bloomfield agrees, and he does the procedure. He's able to cure him of the cancer and save his vocal cord. The nice thing about this is the fact that once he went back to work, he then went back to his residents and interns and made them, he assigned each one of them a diagnosis and made them pretend that they were the patient and go through the procedures that they would expect that patient to go through with that diagnosis to show them what it is to be a patient, how it feels to be a patient, and show them that you should have some compassion when dealing with patients and show them that you do care and be emotionally attached and show them some dignity as well. Um, I feel that that's an important. I've noticed as time has went on, myself as a nurse, and this, this movie brought this back to me, and I'm glad I watched this movie. You set out when you first come out of nursing school to do the best for everyone and that's always the goal for us but you try not to become jaded. Um, I've been a nurse for 12 years and I'm a newborn nurse and have been for the whole entire time and it's it's really hard sometimes I've noticed to be um, a nurse taking care of newborns and then know that you're going to have to hurt them you know, I hold for spinal taps, put IVs in the babies, I stick them for labs, and watch them go through drug withdrawal uh, due to their mother being a drug addict. Um, you have to become detached somewhat in order to deal with those kinds of things. I, I work in a newborn nursery. 98% of the time where I work, it, it's a happy environment, but there are those times that you have babies that are born that aren't going to live. Um, and you be there, you know, you're there emotionally for the patient, but you still have to be detached somewhat in order to make it through the day. And I've noticed as time has went on that my colleagues and I refer to certain babies as that's the antibiotic baby, or that's the spinal tap baby, or that's the drug baby, or that's the 35 weeker. But really, you know, that's someone's newborn, that's someone's baby, that's someone's grandchild. Um, you know, they stand in the window and see you doing, admitting this baby, and this might be my fourth or fifth delivery of the day that I'm having to admit um, and go through the motions to take care of this baby, but to them, that's their world, and it might be a little aggravating sometimes if they're standing at the window knocking on it, wanting to see the baby, um, but this movie brought that back to me, to take a step back and realize that you know, on that side of the coin, that's everything to them. And I've noticed after I've watched this movie that I've tried to get back to the to the root of what I wanted to do as a nurse and why I became a nurse in the first place and be a little more emotionally attached as the day goes on when I'm at work. Um, and I, so I'm glad I watched this movie. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that my friend suggested this for that reason. To make it a little bit more realistic, this movie, I would have liked them to elaborate more on the part where he makes the residents and interns go through these procedures. That's how the movie ended. He told them to put on a gown and that they were going to be doing this. I wish that they would have shown those. Um, because I honestly think that, you know, this movie would be nice to show to our residents and interns because I work in a teaching facility to get them to understand what they're asking a patient to do and understand that they do have emotions and feelings and that they are human and to start out their career knowing that. Um, that would have been very nice to see. But I, I'm glad that I watched this movie, and I learned a lot from it, and um, thank you.